So please do take a seat quickly. We will uh, start at a short notice. You have some rooms there in the front of a room. So if you're looking for a seat, please come to the front, to, uh, to the front of the room. So, dear hosts, dear colleagues, dear liberal friends and attendees, it is a pleasure and a privilege for me to welcome you to the 52nd Liber Conference here in Budapest. I am very thankful to our hosts, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, dear Professor Freund, um, and uh, more specifically, the Library and Information Center, dear Professor Monarch, as well as the Central European University with the support of the University Library. We are fully aware how lucky we are together, meet and network in this multicultural city of Budapest, thanks to the commitment of our Hungarian colleagues who dedicated time and energy during the past year and month to prepare the best possible experience for us all as participants. Budapest means a lot for our community. All across Europe, research libraries have been early adopters and ambassadors, not to say initiators, of open access initiatives and policies. The first institutional repositories, often developed and managed by libraries, date back to more than 20 years. Open science is being seen nowadays as a standard component of research strategies. Very few young researchers and librarians know that it has been a long and tricky road, starting small in activist circles, trying to change rules and practices to create a world where science would really be open and shared to achieve the ultimate goal, turning science into a global and public good. One of the earliest and most important milestones on that road to open science is definitely the Budapest Open Access Initiative in 2022. Though followed and sustained by many other declarations, the initiative is still vivid and celebrated its 20th anniversary in February 2022. The Budapest Declaration is indeed tightly connected to the theme of our 2023 conference, Open and Trusted Reassessing Research Library Values. Research libraries are gateways to scientific and scholarly information. They are facilitating flows of scientific information for all, not only the research community, and they are encouraging people and groups to make their own way through data and publications. 2023 is also a very important year for Liber when we launch our new strategic plan. We will, of course, come back to that later during the conference. We indeed have a vision for the future of research libraries for the coming years. I would like to share it with you. By 2027, research libraries will be engaged and trusted hubs as their user communities. They will collaborate with each other with and with local, national, and international stakeholders in their role as change agents and facilitators and take up tasks in public engagement in research. By 2027, research libraries will provide forward-looking, state-of-the-art services for collections, publishing, and curations of information and data and metadata. These services will be relevant to and tailored for user groups inside and outside academia. By 2027, in collaboration with researchers, research library will stimulate, facilitate, co-develop and manage infrastructures and practices designed to take open science to the next level in order to fully achieve an ambition that was born some 20 years ago here in Budapest. To do that, we have also identified two fundamental preconditions. The first one has to do with skills and competencies. This is indeed a fantastic challenge for us librarians. Our environment is moving incredibly fast. The data deluge is happening now in higher education and research, 
and libraries are heavily involved. Artificial intelligence is already a reality, and the impact on libraries, librarians, and patrons will be huge soon. Training and learning are becoming more and more important for libraries, and there is an increasing need to support the development of critical thinking, to fight against misinformation and misuse of information, and to promote the use of scientific methods as a standard through society. Libraries are among the most important players there, but to fully play this role, we need a continuing effort to upskill our workforce so that the staff of research libraries will have the necessary knowledge, confidence, and skills to take on the organizational and technical changes enabling the new roles and tasks of research libraries. The Central European University here in Budapest is also a perfect location to elaborate on the second fundamental precondition we have identified in our new strategic plan. I am very thankful to our host to have chosen this venue for the conference here in our alma mater in a university. Liber defense and supports values that are consubstantial to universities and more broadly to higher education and research that we consider as public goods. Diversity, equality, inclusivity and solidarity, integrity and transparency, academic freedom and sovereignty, and users' rights. University would be at threat without those underpinning values, providing guidance and safeguards for our research community and beyond for the society in general. We, as a European higher education and research community, all together with our members and partners, will keep promoting those values. These topics will indeed be part of our roadmap in the coming months and years. We still have a lot of work to do, but when I see how engaged and supportive you are, I am confident we will be able to take research libraries to the next level for the benefits of our communities and users, and more generally speaking, for the benefits of the whole society. Coming to the end of my speech, I would like to warmly thank you, Professor Frant, and more broadly to the whole Academy of Science, not only for hosting the conference, but also for the engagement and generosity of your team that has been truly impressive during the past months and weeks. We are immensely grateful to you for that. Dear colleagues, dear liberal friends and attendees, have a nice, fruitful, and exciting conference. Dear President Roche, dear President Freud, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted that we are all here. It was in uh, 1992 when Budapest could welcome the Liber Annual Conference. At the time, the National Seicheni Library was the local host of the conference. Since that time, our tasks have been changing a lot but luckily, the commitment of the new generation is constant. In, uh, you can see uh, the topic of our conference, open and trusted. And uh, with the, okay. <laughs> he is too high. And uh, in the subtitle, reassessing research library values. Uh, it's really important to be able to change, but don't forget, we are all European. And uh, in the antiquity, Greek antiquity, uh, from the Greek antiquity, we have some fragment of philosophers. And uh, one the, the well uh, known is Pantarei. All is changing. And I uh, cite another uh, quotation from the Roman antiquity, Cicero, tempora mutantur et nos mutamur in illis. So the time change and our, we uh, change too. But uh, never forget to find the middle way because uh, we must keeping in mind to the traditional values and the innovation. 
and without knowing the tradition, uh, the innovation is not really possible. Now, it is a privilege for me to ask the president of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences to welcome you on behalf of the Hungarian researchers and the Hungarian Academy of Science. Dear President Roche, dear Director General Istvan Monok, ladies and gentlemen, as the President of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, it is my great pleasure to welcome you all to Budapest. Nowadays, it is not easy to be a researcher or a librarian. Being a researcher myself, I am aware of the challenges we all have to face in a world of information flood. First of all, I would like to take this opportunity to thank the multitude of librarians who do their best day after day to support our work. I am convinced that the Budapest Open Access Initiative, which was signed 21 years ago, will be mentioned a lot during the forthcoming three days. President Roche mentioned it already twice. In advance of your discussions, I wish uh, to emphasize that although we haven't quite fulfilled the 2002 goals of the Budapest Open Access Initiative, actually we have achieved a lot more. It is not merely open access that we have uh, been working for, but also for open science, in which librarians have played a significant part. You librarians are the drivers of open science. Looking at the 52nd Liber Annual Conference Program, I am delighted to see how complete and diverse it is. It also gives me great pleasure to know that all European perspectives are equally represented here, the North, the South, the East, and the West. 45 librarian, uh, Hungarian librarians have registered for the conference, and there are 98 librarians from Central and Eastern Europe. This is an opportunity to listen to each other and find the common roots of what we share. Though our paths and how we reach our aims may be different, it is reassuring to see that we are all working towards the same goals, ready to join forces to reach our objectives. Today, Professional, that is, purely professional dialogue is becoming increasingly important. This conference is an excellent example of how to keep non-professional considerations at bay and discuss issues that we have a fundamental impact, that have a fundamental impact on scholarly information supply. I also wish to express my gratitude to Director General Istvan Monok and his team I am very proud of the Library and Information Center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. As the president of the Academy, I can always rely on them and their expertise. Finally, let me invite you to take advantage of your stay in the Hungarian capital and enjoy your hospitality. At the end of, the, of a satisfying day of professional exchange, make sure to get a taste of Hungarian cultural heritage, cuisine, and viticulture. On that note, may I wish you an exciting and fulfilling and a fruitful conference and a memorable stay in Budapest. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, for that. Uh, we really uh, appreciate your kind words uh, uh, for, for that, and we, again, we are so happy to, to, to be here. So uh, let's move to, uh, to another part of uh, this opening ceremony because we will have a meeting of participants. So it's my pleasure to open the, the meeting of participants today uh, and, and to introduce our Liberal Secretary General, Anya Smith, who, which will explain a little bit how it will go. Anya. Thank you very much, uh, Julien. Um, 
it is the tradition to open the formal meeting of participants, that is, all member libraries and organizations, here at the start of the annual conference. We will um, discuss in that annual meeting every year the operations of the LIBER organizations, and the meeting of participants is asked to approve of important decisions. Our meeting will be tomorrow at 4 p.m. in this room. In this meeting, all formal delegates from all our participants will be asked to approve of uh, proposals by way of voting. Um, the voting will be done in person here in this room by um, uh, holding out voting cards. Um, you can get your voting card if you are a delegate of your organization at the Lieber desk. You can also get one uh, at when you enter the, um, um, the auditorium um, tomorrow. Now, we have a lot of entrances here, I think, so <laughs> anyway, they will be handed out um, um, here too. Um, what is important always is to, um, to announce the changes to the Libre board at this point in time, because if there are vacancies, you have the time to look at who you're going to vote for. Now, there are no vacancies to the board this year, so there are no elections for new board members. There are, however... reappointments to the board. Maybe as a reminder, uh, board members are uh, eligible to serve a maximum of three terms in the board. Each term is two years, so they can serve a maximum of six years. Um, the board reappoints people, but it has to be ratified by the meeting of participants, and I will now announce the reappointments for this year for you to consider. There are five reappointments. Uh, re um, <clears throat> first of all, uh, Andreas Brandner from the Freie Universität in Berlin in Germany, um, who will um, be reappointed for a third and therefore last term. Heli Kautonen from the Finnish Literature Society, also reappointed for a third term. Birgit Schmidt from Göttingen, uh, State University and Library in Germany. Uh, Hilde van Wijngaard in her role as treasurer for Lieber, also for a third term from the Vrije Universiteit in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And um, lastly, um, you see here my picture. Um, I will, um, I'm up for reappointment for a second term as your secretary general, that is more or less the housekeeper for, um, for Lieber. So um, this is what I wanted to uh, inform you about. Thank you very much. Dear colleagues, it is my pleasant duty uh, to inform you about the proceedings of the current uh, uh, conference. It's, it is a pleasure for us to be here. My name is Jan Tsakonas. I'm uh, the Liberal Vice President and I'm chairing the program committee. So allow me a few uh, updates. Uh, similarly, like the last couple of years, we have the n this number of submissions, around 135, uh, 40. And we had uh, 99 oral presentations, 16 poster presentations, seven panel proposals, 13 workshop proposals. All these were evaluated by our colleagues in the program committee that I would like to thank from uh, this uh, point uh, for the very hard and uh, fair work that they are doing. Uh, the main uh, topics, because we had uh, six topics from uh, addressing the key theme that Professor Monock mentioned before, open and trusted, reassessing uh, research values, research library values. Uh, the main three topics in terms of uh, you know, submissions is supporting the pillars of open science, which is a key uh, point for our community, building sustainable infrastructures, a growing interest uh, within our members, and engaging with library communities. Uh, so, during uh, the next days, together with the three keynote speeches that uh, you will have uh, the opportunity to attend to, starting uh, a few minutes later with Professor Sandor Ross, 
uh, you will have the, as I told you, the opportunity to uh, attend to 36 presentations, to uh, vote for 11 poster presentations, to see them and vote uh, which one is the best. Uh, two panels, and of course, earlier today you had uh, uh, the chance to uh, work together with other colleagues on 11 workshops and from what I hear everything was very satisfying and everything was so engaging. Um, some statistics, uh, we had fewer countries submitted. These statistics are based on the submitting author, okay? So perhaps they are not very accurate but you know this is the, uh, the, 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 the key point. We had fewer uh, countries since uh, last year, since Odense in Denmark, uh, and fewer accepted uh, countries. Uh, still few submissions from the southern and eastern countries. We would like to uh, invite again the colleagues from those countries to submit their works, uh, ask us how they can improve if they have been rejected in the past and they have been discouraged. No, we are an open conference, uh, so everyone is invited. So if, we, if you would like to work together to, uh, to help you, please uh, feel free uh, 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 to talk to us. A slightly increased submissions from countries outside of Europe. We are very glad that the uh, colleagues, for instance, from Canada or the United States are seeing our conference and are participating. I think that it's a sign of uh, the link between the associations uh, with the uh, other research library associations. More workshops and an increase of female authors, again based on the submission author. Uh, we are continuing to seek ways to improve the conference. We want to make it more engaging, to broaden the participation, as I told you, to highlight excellent cases from all countries. There are good cases, best practices from all countries, and every case matters to us very much. So uh, if you have any ideas, any concerns, you are free of course, during the course of those, day, uh, of those days to talk to me and other members of the uh, conference program committee. But we have two slots during the coffee breaks uh, tomorrow, uh, the second coffee break, uh, and the first coffee break on Friday, room uh, 102 in this building. Uh, feel free to have a coffee uh, and uh, help us improve uh, uh, the annual conference of LIBRA. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I also would like to welcome you. And uh, I would like to let you know a few very important information. Uh, if you just look at your badge and you turn it around, you will see that there are stickers uh, at the back side. This is a public transport pass down here. You can use it uh, uh, from Wednesday today until Friday midnight for free. So you can use the public transport for free, just you have to show the driver or the, uh, the conductor that you have this. Okay, this is valid with your ID card actually, so your ID card might be asked as well. And uh, the food preferences and allergies are indicated on the backside as well. If you are in any problem with these things, you know, food, if you can eat it or not, please go with your batch to the catering company and they will help you. Thank you very much. My name is Lars Burman, and I have the honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, Professor Sandor Sos. Sandor is active in the areas of scientometrics and science studies, and he is the head of Department for Science Policy and Scientometrics at uh, uh, the Library and Information Center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Sander has a long list of publications to his name. He lectures widely, collaborates internationally, and sits in various editorial boards in his field. 
we are now really looking forward to hearing you talk on the subject of the complex interaction between open science and the world of research metrics galore. Please. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. I would like to warmly welcome you all on behalf of the host institution organization, the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, the Library and Information Center of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and on behalf, okay, that's, okay, okay, okay. And on behalf, yes, that's better. <laughs> and on behalf of uh, our department as well. Uh, before indulging ourselves into the depths and intricacies of open science, let me uh, say a few words about our department. Um, this is the so-called Department of Science Policy and Scientometrics, which is both a research group, a research department, and a service provider for the Hungarian academic sector, but it has quite a history. Actually, the founder of this department was the so-called Budapest School of Scientometrics back in the 1980s, with such key figures and internationally renowned figures of scientometrics as Tibor Brown, Wolfgang Grenzel, or Anders Schubert for that matter, who launched the journal Scientometrics back in the days, which is still a flagship journal internationally of this field. So this is quite a legacy that we have to take care of. And it's no surprise then, then the perspective that I would like to take and I want you to take, actually I would enforce you to take today, is that of metrics and measurement. But it's not for its own sake, actually. But it's, there is a good reason for that. It turns out that open science has a lot to do, uh, historically also, with metrics. Actually, according to a literature review on mapping back in the days, one school of thought within open science, the whole movement of open science, is actually the so-called measurement school. Okay, that's nice, but this kind of talk is cheap, saying that there are complex relationships is quite cheap. So let, let us just break it down. What kind of relationship it is, and what are the elements of this relationship? Uh, so in the fourth, uh, I, I think that, that's, that that will be the key slide that I want to show you, and that the key summary, basically. Because I think that to draw a map of how open science relates to measurement is uh, the huge, uh, the biggest step towards understanding. So first, so we will break it down actually, what kind of complex relationship it is. First, there comes and there is the measurement of open science as such. That's plain, that's easy. Of course, we want to measure the performance of open science, the prevalence of open science, and the benefits of it, mostly the benefits of it. We would say that that is easy, but it turns out that it is by far not. There is a next level. Actually, we are getting uh, deeper and deeper into the open science promise, let's say. And the next level is a measurement, I, I would call it the measurement by open science. This school or this, this approach actually claims or offers that open science provides new tools, new means, new data, new kind of things for measurement, actually for evaluation purposes for, for that matter. So it's actually the infrastructure that open science can offer, which uh, interacts with measurement here. And the, the promise here is, of course, that there will be, or there are, there have been many new tools to use for that, for that purpose. And I think that the deepest level involved in this uh, relationship, in this complex relationship, is the measurement of the openness of science. Now, the difference between this and all the other ones is that uh, there is also a promise that open science, by and of itself, can offer different constructs to measure. So what we measure is different from what we measure, usually measure uh, within, within, within research assessment or, or, or research evaluation. By, we can, by open science, we can measure something different, a new kind of impact, basically, it is. And uh, it's probably not a surprise that the name for it is called Altmetrics, which uh, actually a huge promise to provide new measures, 
new ways, new methods, and as I said, new constructs to be measured, which is a, a hugely different thing from, from, the, from, all the, from all the other approaches of research assessment or scientometrics for that matter. Of course, there are complex relationships between these levels and they can reinforce each other. Of course, if we have new measurement by open science and the measurement of the openness of science, it can reinforce the measurement of open science in new ways as well. So, in this presentation, what I would like to really do is to, to provide a critical overview, if not a review, a critical overview of the most salient issues related to these different levels. Uh, just a word of warning in advance. Uh, I will be critical, this will be a critical review, but I will not be critical with open science itself, I have to declare that. I will be critical with the views and also the perceptions, also the widely held uh, views on open science. So let's go step by step. Let's start with the easiest one, the measurement of open science. And the most salient issue, of course, there are many issues with the measurement of open science, the prevalence, for example, how to actually um, characterize the prevalence. But there is a famous one, and uh, this is about the benefit, the main benefit of open science, which is famously called the open science citation advantage, which is, or which can be described in such a way. So it's a natural assumption, of course. It's, a, it's quite intuitive that open science somehow helps and leads to increased scientific impact. This is the claim that we are dealing with here. Actually, why is it important? Okay, that's, that's fine, but why is it important for us? Actually, as Stephen Harnard once wrote, the, one of the key figures of the open access and open science movements, research impact itself would seem to be the natural rationale for maximizing research access. So according to Harnard back in the days, uh, this is the most important incentive for researchers, the drivers, the main drivers of the open access community, to actually maintain and develop uh, open science as such. So if no benefits, no open science developments. This is why it is important. Okay, let's measure it. How to measure the open access uh, citation advantage. Of course, we are talking about open access here. Let's uh, consider two propositions. Proposition one is, is this. This would be what we want to measure, some say. Some say. Open access publications are more or more likely to be cited than, no, than non-open access publications. Is it, I mean, several people say that this is the actual claim on the citation advantage. But it turns out that this is not the actual claim on citation advantage. The real, let's say, scientific claim on citation advantage would be this proposition that any publication would have been more likely to be or more cited if it had been open access. This is an important difference uh, between the two propositions. Why? Because actually the first proposition involves a comparison of two different populations, of two different populations of, of papers uh, differing in many respects, not just in the open access and open science uh, respect. Whereas the second one involves a comparison of two different situations in the same population, and the, same, uh, the two situations differ only in the open access status. So the other factors that might affect, that might actually contribute to the highest, uh, highest higher scientific impact would not contribute there. This is called a counterfactual conditional in philosophy, and counterfactual conditionals are good for validating causes, basically. So causal statements can, in principle, be validated by such propositions. And actually, we want to know if open access status is the cause of the open access citation advantage. Because if, not, if it's not the cause, then something else causes it. So this is the first and most, uh, well, salient problem with, with the measurement of open science and citation advantage. So there are two corresponding research designs and research strands according to these two propositions. The first one is being approached by observational studies, so-called observational studies, and many studies, actually most of the studies in this field are observational and therefore highly criticized on that ground. Uh, and the other one is called experimental studies, for that matter, where experimental studies are actually uh, claims to account for causes. Because uh, an experimental study such as like this, this is the, uh, the, the exposed study uh, from, from the literature, is one of the most famous experimental studies, the so-called Davis study. 
are randomized controlled trials, just like in the life sciences. So there is an intervention that let's take a set of documents and provide open access status for a subset of it and do it by randomization. So actually randomize these documents into open access and non-open access groups and measure citations throughout the experiment, throughout time, how citations accrue. This is what we want to actually study and compare at the end, compare the two groups, the control group and the treatment group. Now, this would be something that uh, could in principle account for the open access status as the cause. Uh, however, I mean, in principle, because uh, by randomization, we actually uh, have taken care of other factors and we actually focused on the open access status as the real cause as well, I mean, uh, only. Uh, okay, so this is the type of study that, that would be actually desirable if we want to take it very seriously. However, as I've said, many studies and most of the studies are observational. Uh, they actually just uh, measure this thing after the fact, so they measure it respect, uh, retrospectively, the open access citation advantage, and they try to actually control for the other factors of, open, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, citation advantage by statistical means, but basically uh, by being observational, it's uh, kind of a, um, well, a risky exercise to do that. However, observational studies do something more. And this something more is that they want to somehow account for the structure of causality. So what uh, experiments usually don't do is that they try to actually break it down where in this causal network open access, the open access status stands. So what other factors contribute to the open access status? For example, in this study, in this example study, it's not directly on open access, but it's visibility, which is highly related to open access. Uh, there was the other factors was the uh, where this saves the discussion and the recommendation of altmetric devices uh, as mediating variables, as mediating factors towards an increased citation and the citation advantage. So it turns out that observational studies also can contribute by actually identifying very important factors related to the open access status, but not necessarily the open access status itself. Okay, um, to sum up and uh, to to somehow do justice on this question, because of course we, want, we don't want this is research designs, we want justice, whether open access citation, ex I mean, whether uh, advantage exists or not. Uh, we can turn to research synthesis, systematic reviews for that matter, which is the top of the evidence pyramid. What the synthetic, I mean, synthetic studies that somehow gather and analyze these individual results together say about whether open access uh, citation advantage exists or not. It turns out that the result is inconclusive, at least. One recent such study, for example, analyzed a lot of study. Uh, as we can see, experiments were uh, just a few, just two experiments were in the sam uh, sample, because most of the studies are observational. And it turned out that basically just as much study says that the open access citation advantage exists, as uh, there are studies on the contrary, I mean concluding on the contrary, and also uh, some other, well, uh, demonstrations show that uh, the, the actual reliability of the studies, so the biases that are included in the studies are very high, in, uh, including uh, research design, including population, including many other factors of the study. So in sum, we can, we can actually say that there, there are interesting tendencies uh, in relation to the measurement of this kind of thing. So the open access citation uh, uh, advantage is typically found in observational studies, but not really found in experimental studies. And we actually insist that experimental studies can uh, provide causality, then it's a strange result. There are many critiques, of course, of experimental and uh, also observational studies. Uh, such as short-term experimental studies are short-term studies, that they depend on small and context-dependent samples, but ob observational studies also depend on context-dependent samples. To show you, actually, the problem of context dependence from Hungary, because, of course, I have to bring an example from home, so uh, mm -hmm. I just show, uh, show you an excellent example of context dependence of the open access citation advantage. Uh, this is a study we have uh, actually conducted lately. 
uh, this is a study that, uh, that shows the contribution, basically, of a very important set of open access publications to the scientific impact of the Hungarian publication output, namely of the scientific for the scientific impact of uh, uh, higher education in, uh, organizations. And the, and the figure shows that basically there is no uh, real contribution, or actually it's a bit more uh, differentiated than that, it's a bit, bit more complex than that. Up to a certain level of research impact, let's say, it seems that, uh, I mean, depending on the specific context, depending on this uh, specific set of publications, there is no real contribution to, to the scientific impact. So the problem is altogether that we have very important studies, and of course, important in the sense that uh, those are also important incentives to, to do the open access exercise that uh, show uh, and also convince us that it's intuitive to think of the open access citation advantage as a thing. Actual and especially in specific context, actual studies and especially in specific context, the problem arises that uh, there is no real detectable contribution in many cases. Of course, again, depending on the context and uh, depending on, <laughs> it, it has changed, I mean the, the tone has changed, so uh, I'm guessing that it's getting more and more <laughs> risky what I'm saying here. So, <laughs> so anyway, 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 this is the problem and uh, let's be clear about this, this is just the problem that I want to demonstrate. Okay, quickly let's move on for the next thing. It's a much, much more interesting thing because it's a, it's a uh, much more widely known thing. It is the, the measurement powered by open science. The measurement and the promise of new types of research metrics that open science could provide us with. Uh, actually, independently of uh, the initial movement back in uh, 2010, uh, uh, around 2010, also uh, this kind of uh, approach, this kind of proposal uh, has uh, has uh, appeared on an official level as well, because uh, the European Union, back in the days actually, uh, released an expert-based review, an expert-based document on the so-called next generation metrics, responsible metrics, and the evaluation of open science. This was the title and the title. I'm, no, I'm sure that you are very aware of this, and it's a well-known document. And this is basically kind of a, I mean, this is more than one thing, but it's kind of an official um, start for, 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 for promoting so uh, the alt metrics, the alt metrics movement. The promise is that open science paves the way for new metrics of scientific performance. And it's not just new metrics, but we measure something else with alt metrics. This is the real promise, so new constructs will be measured. Uh, also, it's commonly held that it goes beyond and even replaces bibliometric measurement and bibliometric constructs, which measures usually scientific impacts and, and the rest, quality and so. It is called art metrics, and the real promise, the real actual promise in this, that it will measure social impact, the social impact of science, and this is the, the buzzword here. We all know, we probably all know the technological development, the technological opportunities, artmetrics.com and so on and so forth. So on the technology level, on the service provider level, Artmetrix is very uh, virulent and there. But uh, also back in the days also, when the movement uh, has initiated, there were some skeptic, uh, uh, skeptical approaches as well, some, some skeptical comments and some skeptical expert views as well. For example, Back in 2015, the uh, Association of the uh, UK Higher Education Organizations released the metric tide, the, metri the, the document called Metric Tide, where art metrics was also evaluated. And they actually expressed some kind of skepticism whether art metrics really captures this new kind of construct, this uh, social impact of science instead of scientific impact for that matter. Uh, Actually, what they communicated is a quite widely held view today um, uh, in, the, in, the, well, in the science studies community that uh, although art metrics measures a lot of things, it is usually at first, in the first place, it is usually dissemination as such instead of impact because impact is something much more tractable, impact is something much more concrete and impact is something much more accountable than 
than, than, the, than what Altmetrix actually provides us with. I don't want to go into this kind of dispute, this kind of, because I'm sure I'm, that you're all well aware of this kind of, this kind of uh, uh, discussion or this kind of discourse. What I would like to show, however, and I would like to actually crit uh, critically raise, is a different question. I mean, the question of what Altmetrix is for. I mean, let's, let's just, let's just uh, accept for a minute, for a moment, that Altmetrix is for social impact. Uh, let's turn to, of course, what else? Let's turn to research. Let's turn to scientometric research. And let's... Uh, actually scrutinize the typical scientometric research into Altmetrix, because there's a lot actually there. Altmetrix is uh, quite a hot topic in scientometrics for a long time now, and uh, it has been a habit of researchers to deal and to analyze Altmetrix as such. Now the typical research is like this. I'm just, again, showcasing you a prominent and also a characteristic one. This kind of research is a but it uh, uh, it tries to tries to measure, evaluate the the contribution and the meaning, basically, of altmetrics, so of specific altmetrics measures, because of course altmetrics is a bunch bunch of tools. By the comparison of something, the comparison of expert recommendations in a certain paper, which is the F thousand paper, where it is feasible to do such things. So the comparison, basically, of expert evaluations, recommendations, and altmetric measures. Now, altmetric measures are very sophisticated. I should say that the initial concerns about those measures being not sophisticated enough, so therefore not uh, being sophisticated as much as bibliometric measures is now not so much a concern, because these specific measures that have been studied are quite developed. Uh, they actually control for many things that, that uh, should be controlled for in in measuring some kind of impact, some kind of impact, let's say. Uh, now the comparison is about how much these actual measures can capture uh, expert evaluations, so how much alignment there is between expert evaluation and these measures. But the important thing for us today is not this one. I don't want to actually showcase the results of this research. What I would like to expose here is the comparison itself with what it is being compared. It is being compared with expert evaluation, which means that what we expect, what the researchers expected from Altmetrics is to convey scientific quality, not social impact at all. It is scientific quality and there's more. Because other research in Altmetrics, actually research trend in Altmetrics, researches and studies and investigates correlations of citations and citation measures and altmetric measures, which is called convergent validity, actually a quest for convergent validity, how much they converge, uh, how much, to what extent they show the same thing, I mean citation measures for that matter and altmetric measures. Uh, there is research into the predictive power of altmetric measures on citedness, which is called the study of predictive validity. And I'm constantly talking about validities, because validity is the kind of uh, thing that shows us that uh, what it is that we want to measure. So uh, we have to ac actually uh, finally ask the question of what construct it is that we are measuring. And since all these studies, I mean expert reviews, citation counts, citation measures, and everything else, is about scientific quality and impact, we should say that all these studies prove or disprove, confirm or disconfirm the validity of altmetric measures towards scientific impact and not social impact at all. So it seems that we basically got this all wrong <laughs> in a way when we actually uh, expect altmetric measures to convey social impact as such. Uh, of course, uh, there are many advantages to that. I mean, of course, we can use it, for example, if, if we accept this, if we actually accept this kind of claim that Altmetrics really measures scientific impact or tries to measure it, then of course there are many advantages to this respect. Uh, for example, to traditional as compared to traditional bibliometric measures, Altmetric measures are more accessible and more speedy in their measurements since, of course, citations accrue afterwards. 
in time, so it takes, takes a lot of time to actually use uh, them, to be able to use them in retrospective measurements. So this kind of, and this was kind of the original idea as well. Uh, Altmetrics, uh, when it was called article level metrics and not alternative metrics as, today, as, as is today the term. Uh, this was kind of the original idea, but somehow we shifted from it towards the measurement of social impact. Now it seems that it's not. Okay, before concluding, let's uh, move on to the next level. And the next level will be the, basically the most uh, familiar and the most, um, I think, uh, uh, the most um, uh, likable, <laughs> let's say, li likable for this community, because this is about data infrastructures, open data and data infrastructures. So, as you can recall from my, <laughs> from my original, original taxonomy, this is uh, the th third or the second promise that, that open science will provide us and have been providing us with, with tools, with measurement tools, not measurement, not me with infrastructure, infrastructural tools for data, mostly data, uh, that, uh, will, that will help us basically to, to, re to reconsider, um, I mean to, to base research assessment and research evaluation on new grounds, on fully new grounds, for example, to, to somehow go around and to, to replace traditional commercial businesses in, 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 in research evaluation. Okay, let's examine this claim critically as well, uh, not being critical against the strand, again, but being somewhat critical against the views related to this trend. I've selected, uh, of course, I've selected this, this is about citations, but I've selected a, a prominent example, uh, which is not a very, uh, parts of it, uh, parts of it are, are older developments, but it's quite a recent development. Open citations, let's, let's take the example of open citations, which is, which is an initiative to, to basically collect citation relationships uh, regarding and covering uh, the most of scientific communication, as much of scientific communication as possible on an open science basis, of course, and to provide this, uh, to provide the scientometric community, for example, with, with this kind of data source in order to be able to, again, avoid or, 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 or replace the traditional businesses. So, again, as we, as, we, as we usually proceed, the promise of open science paves the way for new data sources and research. Open science uh, citations uh, offers a paradigm shift for proprietary citation indices. So it's freely, it would be freely available, large-scale citation relations, and therefore, uh, used for um, and easily used for for every kind of scientometric and research evaluation purposes. Uh, again, that's that's absolutely uh, that's that 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 kind of initiative is is beyond beyond any criticism. And as it is as much the case that uh, the scientometric community, it was the scientometric community that uh, that actually called for this, kind of, for this kind of approach. And uh, many professional forums basically uh, released declarations on that. So it's definitely from that kind of community, firstly. But still, if we consult this uh, research results, we might have some skepticism again. But this skepticism is just an initial one, perhaps. Uh, what I would like to communicate again is that uh, there are some fundamental problems with, again, with, with this kind of approach, which is beyond the current state of the art, or which is beyond the, uh, beyond the developments or where we stand, actually. So let's turn to, again, one exemplary research issue. Such an issue, I mean, such a research, uh, tried to compare, the quite, let's say, that the value of the Open Citations Initiative. So they compared uh, the production, the research output, and the impact of the research output as assessed by the Web of Science and, and assessed by Open Citations, actually the Crossref database, which is part of Open Citations. The comparison was quite simple. The comparison was based on the share of uh, Crossref citations in the Web of Science that are being obtained. Uh, so, of course, the main research question was whether 
we can replace or they actually this this organized this university could replace web of science entirely by just using open citations data in their research evaluation and research assessment now it turns out that the results are at least partially negative at least in this particular context and in this particular example they said and this is a quote the open citations network in crossref is not yet ready to replace the web of science citations why well, it's simple, because they could not retrieve uh, that amount of citations for their individual research fields that could be retrieved from the web of science. And this is not, and I'm emphasizing it, this is not for the humanities, this is not for the social sciences, not for the problematic areas that we all know that uh, uh, there is a problem for, even for, uh, regardless of whether it's web of science or other uh, platforms to actually cover in terms of citations. Actually, the, this example is entirely on the hard sciences. So they actually studied the hard sciences departments and the hard sciences fields in their study. OK, this is not the problem. Of course, every service can develop, uh, situations can develop. So this is not about where we are at the moment. The problem is that uh, the problem is about sampling. The more fundamental problem of it is sampling. Because uh, it seems that uh, all that all open science initiatives are community-based, which is excellent. Community-based initi initiatives are excellent. Uh, they are actually bottom-up processes. But in a bottom-up process, the sampling will be a bit unsystematic and will be a bit accidental. So this is the problem that no matter how much or how big the actual data set is, the procedure, the, the, the procedure throughout with, with uh, which this actual data set accumulated is quite uh, a sampling that results in not necessarily a representative sample. Whereas in, and this is not again, this is not promoting proprietary databases, but this is kind of a problem for us. Uh, whereas in proprietary databases, the sampling at this, for example, in Web of Science, in the Institute of Scientific Inst uh, Information back in the days, was based on bibliometric loads in order to actually retrieve a representative sample of scientific communication as such. So it makes actual measurement very much context dependent. And uh, the sampling problem, of course, can be overcome. I don't say that it's, there is no way to overcome this kind of problem. What I'm saying is that it seems to be quite an unrealized problem. And because and somehow the enthusiasm uh, behind and for for the open science resources somehow covers this kind of issue, which is and remains an issue for or at least for for research assessment, if not for other exercises. So this is what I call the so-called uh, sampling problem. And the other problem is even more fundamental to say that, or we would say that. It is the problem of standardization for, at least for research assessment, but not necessarily for just for research assessment. Uh, in this scheme, in this schematic representation, originally I've tried to depict the actual factors that affect the citation impact. I mean, obtained by a specific measure that is a common measure nowadays, uh, that uh, actually affect the citation impact of a certain entity, of a certain subject, author, organization, and such. And we can actually see that citation count and citation coverage, database coverage for that matter, is only one or two actual factors for that. Because all the other factors actually are needed for the standardization and the comparability of units, of measurements. And in this example, uh, those are field classification uh, and the, all the intricacies of field classification, the content of field categories, the reference values for field categories, in order to be able to come up with a measure that is actually for, for the construct of scientific impact as such and not for something else. So we all need, basically we all need these factors uh, in order to come up with a valid measure of scientific impact for that matter. And it seems that this kind of standardization is not, uh, not really an option or not really a general option for for the usage of such data sets and databases. Uh, and even, even if, of course, on the user side, for example, such standardization is taking place, we can also, um, we can also, also, also 
or we should also deal with the problem of the context dependence of that. So uh, I mentioned the web of science, basically that's a universe and there is a universal standardization in, uh, built in in that service. Now this kind of universal standardization, so the same grounds on which we can compare certain units and subject is what is missing from these actual uh, services. Although it's not something that cannot be overcome, I'm just posing it as a problem. Okay, altogether. Uh, altogether we can somehow uh, see that uh, if we, if we don't, don't take these kind of issues seriously, we run the risk of uh, history repeating in a certain sense. Actually, the, the history of bibliometrics repeating in a certain sense. The history of the impact factor is the time actually <laughs> referring to, because according to historical studies of bibliometrics, the, 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 the popularity of the impact factor was due to an initial policy push and technology pull. So it was basically not a well studied as we all know it wasn't a well-studied device, uh, the validity of which wasn't uh, studied well back at the time when it became popular, but actually the appeal of such a device for easy and quick uh, research assessment and for objective and quantitative or quasi-quantitative research assessment was so big that actually it paved the way for the worldwide success of such things as the impact factor. Now, if well, well if, we, if, if we take a look at the present situation, we can, we can find ourselves in a similar situation with open access devices and open access altmetrics measures for that matter, that uh, we don't have the time really to, to explore the validity and the real meaning of those devices and the real addition and the real the value of those devices. And the enthusiasm will somehow overwhelm and overcome uh, the, this arena and may lead to a similar situation as was the case with the impact factor thing. Okay, uh, uh, I, might, <laughs> I might seem, or I might have been seen too critical or, or, or way too critical in, in some respects, so it's, uh, at least I should actually provide some proposal, if not solution, of course solutions cannot be provided at this moment, but uh, some proposals to this summary. And what I'm proposing is something that we already have, really. So it's not something new, it's not something, uh, it's not a distant prospect or something else, it's not a policy uh, goal and, and so on and so forth. It's quite easy, actually. So to sum up, if uh, we all know that open science provides appealing instruments and models for measurement, because we are talking about measurement, the appeal to stakeholders, all that we have been talking about, uh, is dangerous. And those issues that I've tried to uh, communicate, that I've tried to expose, the open access citation advantage debate, the altmetrics confusion, and the open data issues suggest that perhaps it is not uh, those things and not those actual measures that we should use, or not in the first place for that matter. The OACA or the OACA <laughs> debate says that it's not necessarily the size of impact that we have to actually deal with. Uh, it's not alternative constructs such as social impact that we have to deal with necessarily, at least not in the first place. And it's not only alternative data that is needed uh, for, for the successful measurement and open science relationship. But uh, something else is needed which can actually show the benefits and the potential of open science devices. What I call new generation metrics, but it's the new generation of bibliometrics. And this is not new at all, by, by all means. It is totally existent because we have devices, we have actually tools. Uh, we call it structural bibliometrics. This is the structure which actually um, investigates the structure of scientific communication, which is a very well developed and uh, a very rich toolbox, toolkit. It's uh, basically the validity is quite well studied. We kind of, we sort of know what we are measuring with that. And it is not uh, about sheer, uh, sheer sizes of impact, but it's much more importantly, it's how 
actually the open science ecosystem, the open, open access, open in, in that case, but of course the full open science ecosystem is being involved into scientific communication. So for example, what is the knowledge exchange? What is this uh, actual pattern, not the extent, but the pattern of knowledge exchange between open science and non-open science, for example? What is the knowledge exchange characteristic of open science itself, so within open science? As I've said, uh, this is just uh, an example, structural citation analysis, there is a specific field in scientometrics that is being tailored towards such, such, uh, such studies. It's uh, kind of the modeling of the uh, communication, scientific communication, it's called science mapping, but mapping, and it is quite rarely uh, applied in this, in this context. So what I'm actually, without going into detail, of course, in this opening talk, what I'm actually proposing is that we, we can use our original, old, but still new uh, devices, which are original and old in the sense that we already have them, but they are new that they have rarely been applied to this question, rarely, rarely been applied to this issue, but they can be revealing, quite revealing, and quite incentivizing in, uh, in the participation of open science. So the final model that I would like to actually uh, expose and I shall actually share you with is something like this. Uh, it's a different model that we that we have or uh, before that we had before. So before we visualized or before we, we actually hypothesized a relationship something like this that open science leads to social impact and we can measure it directly. So instead what I'm trying to say is that uh, there is a different pathway towards social impact. And this pathway to social impact is actually throughout scientific impact. It goes through scientific impact because open science triggers scientific impact. We can measure this kind of scientific impact with those actual devices that I've been proposing, the patterns of knowledge transfer. This scientific impact, according to Harnad, Stephen Harnad, serves as a great incentive. I mean, this demonstrated scientific impact with these new devices serves as a huge incentive to the actual research community to increase its engagement in open science and open access for that matter, which will actually, or probably likely, increase the prevalence of open science and open access. And that, in the end, will lead to a much higher social impact than before, and that kind of social impact can be measured, but not with these devices. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very, please, Sander, stay. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Sander, for this healthy and critical view. I've learned a lot from this presentation. I'm glad that there are a lot of work being done in uh, responsible measuring. We have time for one or possibly two very short questions because our time has really run out. Thank you. In your presentation, you talked about prevalence of open science and you focused on open access and citation advantage. To what extent have you thought about other ways of measuring the prevalence of open science practices? Um, yes, it was the open access advantage that I was focusing on. Actually, similar things, but uh, open science or open access prevalence, what, what, which was the question. Um, beyond open access, beyond open access. have you yes, thought about other um, ways of measuring prevalence? Yes, actually, actually, I would say that um, it's kind of a new thing. Uh, of course, open access is a, is a, is a very, very, very uh, widely uh, studied and a very, 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 very st uh, studied area. So a lot of evidence uh, have been gathered from, from that area, from this field. And there are a few but increasing number of studies focusing on, for example, open data as such. For example, a study that I wanted to actually bring here, but uh, that would be too much, that, that would have been too much, uh, actually focused on the, the question of how open data, the open data initiative and actually the open, uh, open 
data-related publications, the prevalence of open data-related publications increases uh, scientific impact for that matter. Uh, similarly, well, inconclusive results <laughs> have been drawn for that. So what I well, the, the answer is that uh, it's kind of an uncharted territory yet, but there is an increasing number of research on that matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm afraid that time is running out now. Uh, before we thank Sander with an applause, I would like to remind you that the conference picture will be taken in here just after this keynote speech. So please, uh, if you feel inclined, and I hope you do, stay on for the picture. And now, a big thanks to Sander for this interesting level. <laughs>